Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Min, and I'm with Debbie, your two hosts from the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. And boy, is it ever-changing. Debbie. Yes. Five-year review. We are still going through the uh, implications that have come out in the report for the the five-year review report, SDA prices. And I think we decided that this warranted another short episode talking about particularly uh, the recommendations and the implementation of them. Because uh, one of our listeners, uh, Abdi, one of our past speakers, he, he emailed through this morning saying, can we have a third episode, please? So I thought, yeah, well, we have some questions ourselves. And I'm sure there are many of our listeners also have questions as well. So let's just cover the basics. And so moving backwards, Debbie, it's a five-year review, came out last week on the 16th of June. It says it will start as of July 1, 2023. However. Implemented in on first October. 1st of October, yeah, which basically means that this recommendation, this report has been issued, but it has, it's now gone to the NDIA for review. And they will make their final decision by October the 1st. So none of this is set in stone as yet. They still need to basically sign it off, I guess, is what what we are understanding. I would think that having, having gone through all the, all the feedback and, and um, research analysis the last you know, year or so, I'm sure that this is the recommendations we see here from last week, Debbie are probably 90, 95% firm, but they still need to final sign off. And that's what you, you say to, yeah, that's what you refer to in terms of the NDIA signing off on the final bit. So I'm sure there'll be some more little changes here and there, but very slight, but we'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the implications of this are that even though these prices will officially be taking effect on the 1st of July, since we don't really know what they're going to look like until the 1st of October at the latest, there will be some confusion with how we implement these, who it applies to, and and I guess what would happen is any when, when the prices are confirmed, uh, the, they will be retrospective to the 1st of July. So it is going to be a tricky three months for any existing properties and participants in terms of what funding applies, whether the participant funding is going to be automatically indexed to these new levels or whether the participants have to go through a plan review, which is one of the recommendations that it is automatically indexed. Debbie, when you spoke to someone this morning, didn't you? Who, who did you call? And, and I had a chat to David Whitelaw from Adapt Housing just to go over this particular aspect. What was his feedback? His feedback was that, uh, yeah, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be a bit uncertain for the next few months. He doesn't see that there'll be any real changes in the recommendations, but we just don't know as yet. He was very surprised with the the increased funding for the ILs and FAs in terms of robust, as we brought up as being, we thought, an area that was potentially maybe left behind in this review. He thought that there may be a, um, a, a later subsequent kind of uh, interim review, I guess, that will specifically deal with robust. And hey, maybe in the review that the NDI take on this over the next three months, that may even be addressed. We, we just don't know that. So there's still a lot of uncertainty with this, but, but the general feedback is that these recommendations put out in this report will pretty much on the whole be taken up. Yeah. I think it'll be good to for me just to summarise a few little points that I've read from some other, some other source. And that is, 
there's a bunch of interesting stuff that's coming out of this. And it's all positive too, by the way, uh, out of this report. And it includes the following. New location factors for new build stock with some odd variation. Fire sprinkler costs are better covered now. And there are a recommendation to consider a mandate. And we all know I've been harping on this fire sprinkler topic for a long time with, uh, with Sedana Constructions. Increased pricing for the four or five bedroom group homes, coupled with recommendation that they should serve as a clear warning. And that warning is that they be gradually phased out as being enrolled as SDA dwellings. A recommendation that may suggest the government is warning to the, warming to the idea of SDA self-provision. Debbie, what does SDA self-provision mean, please? That basically, it means that the SDA property owner and provider is the participant. Mm. Yeah, so as you were saying, Debbie, the idea of self, SDA self-provision is an important topic because sometimes we have participants who actually are living in their own um, SDA property. And it's a little bit unfair, I guess, for them to actually have to give up 15% of their income to a external third party being an SDA provider just to manage their own SDA income. Mm. And I guess the reason is that they haven't become their own provider, which they can do at this point, is the complexity of becoming a registered NDIS provider. Mm -hmm. And lastly, a recommendation that should enable additional funding for necessarily bespoke SDA projects that can't fit the price matrix or design standard. Yeah. I think that could be, in the future, uh, the... Um, the robust. The robust topic and also one tenant one housing, housing as well. Potentially, yeah, yeah because that, that, to me, would definitely fall under bespoke. We, we, we had been eagerly awaiting the, the concept of a one resident house for SDA incomes. Obviously, that was never declared in this new uh, recommendation or report. So for the time being, if no changes occur, Debbie, I think we'll, we'll, we'll see that investors and providers have to use the one resident tenant from a villa income numbers for the house. Yeah, in i.e. they're actually registering the property as a, a villa, one resident villa. And also, Debbie, uh, yesterday after we did our second uh, episode on the breaking news here, me and Josh and Danica sat down and did the numbers as to, well, what are the rental incomes between two ILs versus three ILs versus an FA, an IL versus two FAs? And to be honest, Debbie, it is marginal, right? If if an investor thinks, well, we'll, just, we'll try and aim for three participants as ILs in the four-bedroom house, I'm telling you right now, it is not. It may not have been worth the hassle, Debbie. Mm. It, What's the hassle? Finding a third tenant, one, marketing costs, two, compa personality compatibility, three, more furniture costs, four, the stress of trying to find a third p participant, again, all this for 2000 bucks, 3000 bucks. Is it really, like, the, it's very clear what the government in this recommendation, if it is executed as per the, the paper, it's very clear that you can chase three. They're saying you can chase three participants if you want, but if it's almost the same as a two participant, why yeah. bother? Why bother? Obviously, they're they're really aiming to have properties at the two tenant level as the standard. I guess that's what that's what, how I'm reading this. Also, Debbie, another topic or another question I have in my mind, which you've now answered this morning, was what happens to those people who already are on the thirty thousand dollar IL income funding. What happens? Is it automatically lifted up or what? Or what was your, what's your impression or your feedback from David Whitelaw about that topic there, please? Look, it's, it's hoped that that's a recommendation that will definitely be taken up so that participants' plans will be automatically adjusted with the indexation. But we're not going to know that until it kind of happens. And hopefully it will happen sooner rather than later, as soon as those prices are firmed. That will be reflected in the plans. But isn't the isn't the um the indication that it'll be automatically going up? Well, it's one of the recommendations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we hope that yeah that's going to happen because otherwise it's just going to be such a mess if they're requiring every SDA funded participant to go back and have their plan reviewed in order to have these higher income levels 
adjusted in their plan, I mean, that would just be a mess. That yeah. will just take forever. So to me, that's a recommendation that only makes sense. Yeah. It'll, so it'll be stupid be, for them not. It'll be immediately done straight away. Yeah. 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 And David did say to you, Debbie, that after July 1, he'll log on the portal and just check those numbers and see yeah. if they will maybe change. So I guess- What's changing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, what's changing. So I, I reckon by October 1, which is in three or four months- Three months, three months a week. Now, we'll know exactly what the final numbers are and exactly if the existing participants who are already in the system as SDA funded and qualified and living in IL houses, do they get that uplift straight away? My gut feeling is we'll see it automatically reflected in the system straight away without any major logistical nightmares of reapplying for reviews. Uh, that's, that's my my hope. I hope that it isn't that, uh, that um, participants don't go through another ordeal of um of um logistical nightmare with the NDIA. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So I guess in, just a, a summary of this is that this report has brought out some fantastic and very surprising recommendations. The fact that. It has taken the reviewers, the panel, what, seven months to come to these conclusions with a lot of industry consultation. You know, I, th I think that these recommendations will be on the whole taken up as they have been put forward. Uh, but the point is we just don't know at this point. So we're now in our stock list and our feasibilities working out on the generally on the lowest potential new funding, i.e. if you have a three-tenant home, two IL-funded tenants in there rather than a, a more of a, a, a higher funded mix like a HPS and an FA. So starting at the lowest level, but as Min said, I mean, it doesn't really change that much with the different levels of tenant mixes now. But obviously everything that we're putting out will come with the disclaimer that the, these Figures are not yet confirmed by the NDIA. And at this point, until they are, we, yeah, we can only hope. I would, I would dare say they are a very good indication of what they end up being, Debbie. I would say so too. Yeah, yeah. I just want to read a, a, com, a, a line, some paragraphs here. I've just read from another website, Team DSC website. I'll just summarise this word for word here. Uh, the changes that may have caused initial concern for some is high physical support HPS apartment prices. While HPS one-bedroom apartment prices remain largely unchanged, with the exception of increase to account for GST inequities, HPS two- and three-bedroom apartment prices, income-wise, have been reduced. The NDIA is concerned about the high level of supply of HPS one-bedroom apartments has been strongly and publicly signalled for some quite some time. Therefore, it was widely anticipated that the prices for these may not increase. Further, there are numerous other changes announced in the report that will help to offset the HPS apartments results to some extent. This includes increased prices for lower design category apartments that should enable vacancies in HPS apartments to be more easily and viably filled by participants with lower design category eligibility. Furthermore, change to the 20-year new build start date enables the higher new Build, a part, build payment to be received for more of the 20 years. Additionally, there is a clear requirement for the NDIA to now apply any new higher index pricing immediately to participants' plans instead of having to wait for a new plan before this higher rate is implemented. Yeah, which is what we've just been talking about. So back to this very point, the 20-year thing. Yeah, the 20-year thing, what they're basically recommended is that Instead of the 20 years taking effect from when the certificate of SDA compliance has been issued, it starts from when the first tenant moves in. Wow. Or I could be wrong, could be when the property is fully tenant, but I'm pretty sure when the first tenant moves in. So look, I'll be honest, I've been trying to figure out this, this question in my head for the last three years and no one gave me the answer. And that was, is it 20 years from when the scheme started or 20 years from when the house was well, it, built? Yeah, it has been, it's been 20 years from when the house receives its SDA certi certificate of compliance. That's what I've understood. Okay. Well, now it's very clear here as of when, 20 years of when the first tenant moves in, Debbie. Yeah. So that's a good change because especially as we know that tenanting a property is, is taking on average six to nine months, that's people missing out on six to nine months or even more of their 20-year potential income. Yeah, yeah. 
So if you do have an empty house which has not been tenanted, don't be too worried. Your 20 years begins when they first move in. That's good news. Another thing is uh, enrolling the property. So I do know that if a house, a property is full bedroom, full bathroom house, the SDA provider can enroll it as a three-tenant property, meaning OOA carer plus three participants. Sometimes it may be even more viable to have it as enrolled as a two-tenant participant home. Debbie, can you, um, I mean, we spoke about this this morning. Can you explain to our listeners why it can be advantageous to be tenanted as a two-better, two-tenant two house? Well, the, the funding for a participant who has been funded, basically qualified to live with one other person, i.e. in a two-tenant house, is higher than the funding for a participant to live with two other tenants in a three-bedroom house. So you might find that just depending on the um, the participants that are looking to move into a home, if their funding level is two eligible residents, that just works out better for the property to be re-enrolled as a two-tenant property, not a three-tenant property. Mm. And the way the income has been created for well, proposed recommendations here it's it's marginal. Like you might go two IL participants and a carer for 160 grand rent as a base rate, and get three IL participants at 170 grand rent, which is marginally more, mm. only marginal. And as you were just saying before, you know the complications of having a third tenant. It's hard enough to find two that get a compatible and get on well and have the right compatible support sill provider. To get a third person in the mix, it can just be that much more complicated again. But it's also harder to find bigger blocks to build bigger houses, Debbie. That too. Because if you have a third tenant, and we've discussed this in the past year now, a third participant require you would need more space, a second living area, which means more bill costs, which means more land costs, which means, you know, when you have to worry about extra la- uh, land size and build size and extra bedroom, an extra bathroom, an extra living space, an extra courtyard, it all adds costs. And if you're not going to get the return, why bother? Yeah. So the government is sort of saying, well, why would you go there when you make no more money? Now, someone said to me the other day, oh, but I still want to be a block because, you know, it's, it's potentially good capital value, capital growth. Yeah, I, I know. Potent- the key word is potential. <laughs> you know, this is a, this is a income play for a for a bit, as we said, this is for business. The business of, of managing participants in a SDA dwelling is not a property play, it's a business yeah. play. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people still don't actually understand that, Yeah, really. Do not think of this as a property investment. I mean, yes, I know it is a property investment. I know it is. But it's so much more. Yeah. It's all about the, this, the care provider, the estate provider, the participants, the government funding. It's like a real complex business in here because they, they are running a business from the dwelling. That's what it is. And when the participants move on, move out, there is no more income left. Yeah. Because the income follows the participant, not the property. Now, it's interesting that you just touched on the sizes of the land required because in this report, won't go into it now, but that is all, has also been looked at and taken into account with the pricing structure that's been proposed, The um, simply the, the size of the land required for each type of dwelling. So what are those numbers? I'd have to find those in the report, but um, I was surprised actually they're higher than a lot of the properties or they're larger than a lot of the properties we are seeing coming through in terms of the size of land that they are stating is required. Are you saying, so the, they're saying an average size of a HPS block should be the following number? Yeah, here we go. I found it. It is, okay, so for ha- let's just concentrate on houses. For a two-bedroom house, you should have a minimum 360 square area. For a three-bedroom house, you should have a minimum 540 square area. Three-tenant house or three... Sorry, three-tenant. Yeah. No, well, it says bedrooms, but I'm assuming that that means because they don't have a four-bedroom house. So I'm assuming they're talking about t- tenant bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've seen properties that are under the 360, very rarely, for a two-tenant house. And we've definitely got properties that are under 540 for a three-tenant house. So, uh, yeah, look, you know, I, I, as you can hear from this is the third episode we've recorded on this, there is so much 
in this report and they've really taken into account every possible aspect that goes into creating the prices for funding. So uh, still more to unpack, but I think um, that maybe for today that we've for today we've covered another interesting aspect of it. Over the coming weeks, I'm sure we all can get many analysis from commentators about the changes here. It's it's all positive. Look, don't get don't get us wrong. This is all good stuff. It's all positive. These are changes for the better. And we just, we're just eager to see the implementation and the confirmation of these changes for participants and providers and investors to ensure that they have clarity moving forwards. I think we're almost there, Debbie. We're only two or three months away. We're almost there. But uh, everyone's, I think everyone's a winner. Definitely. Yeah. 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 It'd, be, it'd be very rare to, for everyone to say, this is a very bad, these are, these are changes are all very bad. I think they're all good. They're all good. But we'll see in due course. Anyway, Debbie, uh, this is um, this is now part three of <laughs> three episodes. It was supposed to be two, but uh, it is complex what we're talking about here, and we'll keep on going and getting through it all one by one, one day at a time. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.